Yeah, it's good to be with family. It's good to stand here this morning and feel like I'm just chatting to family and to know that I'm loved and accepted. And that's a wonderful, wonderful gift. Um, the word that I want to bring this morning, I've, I've carried for a long time. In fact, since the ladies' seminar. So that's a long, long while ago. But the reason I have is because it's something I had to process. It's something I had to walk through first before I could tell anybody. So I was sitting at the ladies' seminar, um, and Daphne was preaching. And she was talking about Mary Magdalene and how she came in, in and anointed Jesus' feet and washed his feet with her tears. And as I was sitting listening, the Holy Spirit said to me, will you cross the room? And that led me to start thinking. And obviously I had an inkling of what he was saying to me. But then I started to look into scripture and various people who have crossed rooms and what that meant and what that was all about. So I want to look at a couple of people this morning. I want to take us on a journey, if I can, into those situations, because very often the scriptures give us the story, but we need to put the emotions in. We need to put the feeling, the, the room, into it. So I'd like to try and do that this morning, if I could, if you would come with me on this little journey. And so obviously the first one I want to talk about is Mary Magdalene. And... Um, the story is in Luke 7. We're not going to go there, but you can read it. It's Luke 7, 36, verse 36 to 50. And uh, Jesus had been invited to dinner at the, uh, Simon the Pharisee's home. And I don't think it was because they were particularly fond of him. The Pharisees did not like Jesus. But I think perhaps they were trying to trip him up. Perhaps they were just trying to show off we don't know the motive, but Jesus was there amongst the elite of Jerusalem, the movers and the shakers. The Pharisees were very wealthy, very powerful people, and Jesus is having dinner with them. And so you can imagine the room. It was a, a wealthy room, a lot of ego, saturated with the pride of life. They were probably all trying to best one another, trying to show one another exactly how powerful and how influential and how wealthy they were, name dropping, you know, doing all the stuff. And Jesus is in there. And there's music, there's the clinking of cutlery, the servants are scurrying back and forth with food, and in the doorway steps Mary. And in my mind, when I used to read the story, I always imagined it was a bit like there was this kind of passageway and Jesus was there and Mary was here and all she had to do was walk across. But the Holy Spirit said to me, no, because they, they lounged, they reclined on couches while they were eating. So there were these random couches spread all over the room that Mary had to make her way through in order to reach Jesus. And Mary was disqualified on many, many levels from actually being in the room. First of all, she was a woman. She wasn't supposed to be in the room while the men were eating. Secondly, she was a woman of, of a pretty bad reputation. And so walking in the street, those same men would have walked the other side of the road rather than be near her. But she walks into the room. And she starts, can you imagine the silence, the deafening silence that descended on the room in that moment as she steps in and she starts to pick her way around the disqualification and the hatred and the despite and the judgment. What is she doing here? As some of them are even pulling their feet out the way just in case her robe touches them and defiles them. But she makes her way across the room. She ignores the disqualification in her own heart, never mind the disqualification around her, until she gets to Jesus and she begins to anoint him. Why did she do that? Why would she cross that room? It's because she carried a revelation, a prophetic revelation, 
while the other disciples were still busy wondering when Jesus was going to overthrow Rome and arguing about who was going to be the, the most important when all of this happened, Mary understood that Jesus was going to die. She carried something. She had a destiny and a calling. And she came to anoint Jesus for his death. And when she gets there, Jesus covers her. He covers her with his words. He covers her vulnerability and the exposure that she's feeling. And he turns to Simon the Pharisee because he understands, he hears his heart. And he says, you've done nothing for me. You didn't even wash my feet, which was customary, the polite thing to do. But this woman has not stopped washing my feet with her tears. And then he turns to her, which is the most beautiful thing. And he says, your sins are forgiven. She didn't even ask. But he says, your sins are forgiven. Because she carried something. The next person I want to look at is Ruth. Her story is in the book of Ruth. There is a, a famine in Bethlehem. And Naomi, her husband Elimelech, and their sons Marlon and Chilion leave Bethlehem and go to Moab. Now Israel and Moab had been enemies for years, for centuries. It wasn't the place you should be going. It was also known as an idolatrous and sexually immoral country. So you can imagine that when Naomi announced in the marketplace with her friends that oh, our family's going to Moab, I don't think that was greeted with much joy. They emigrated. <laughs> While they're in Moab, um, Marlon, Chilion, and Elimelech die, leaving Naomi and two daughters-in-law, one of which is Ruth, on their own. And they come back to Bethlehem. Now again, I don't know that they were welcomed with open arms when they came back. Because it's very much a case of, oh, so you left when things were bad. Now that things are good, here you come again. So I don't know that they had a warm welcome when they came back. They're two widows. They had no way of supporting themselves. They, basically, they were destitute at that point. They were, Ruth was picking up the scraps left over by the harvesters in order to stay alive. But there comes a moment when Naomi says to her, get dressed in your glad rags, go down to the threshing floor. And Ruth goes down, again, disqualified on many levels. She's not, she's not from the house of Israel. She's a widow. She's destitute. She's helpless. She's vulnerable. She's exposed. But she crosses the room. She crosses the threshing floor. She steps over the sleeping bodies of the guys who have been partying, because they, did, they had a big party when the harvest was in. And she lies down at the feet of Boaz, which culturally was actually something of a marriage proposal. So she was being quite sassy, actually. <laughs> so she lies down at his feet. And she says these words, which to me are the most beautiful words in the book of Ruth. I know everybody loves the other one about forbid me not to leave you and all of that. That's lovely. She says to him, <laughs> she says to him cover me. Extend the border of your mantle over me because you are my nearest kinsman. I love, you can see, I love that scripture. I love it. And he covers her. And he marries her. And they have a son called Obed, who has a son called Jesse, who is the ancestor of David, who is the ancestor of our Jesus. So Ruth was carrying a destiny and a calling and a purpose. And when she was just a pagan woman somewhere in this idolatrous, sexually immoral country who had no understanding of God, God had chosen her. 
She didn't get chosen when she got to Bethlehem. Mary was chosen when she was still in the alleys, plying her trade. God had chosen her. And so Ruth crosses the room because of calling and destiny. Then the one I want to look at last is Mephibosheth. Yes, I went there. I've been practicing this name for weeks. <laughs> And I sincerely hope I can get through this. But who was this Mephibosheth? Besides someone with a bit of a strange name. Mephibosheth is the son of Jonathan, who was the grandson of King Saul. And um, in 2 Samuel 4, we briefly, we won't look there, I will read you the scriptures just now, and I think it's going to be up there. But we, we briefly come across him in 2 Samuel 4. And what had happened was Saul, because of disobedience, because of his jealousy, because of his fear of man, had lost the kingdom. God had taken the kingdom from him. So Saul and Jonathan are killed in battle. And the culture of the time was that if a king was killed, the incoming king would have his whole family wiped out. To, to avoid any competition. So it was a hostile takeover in the true sense of the word. So when the news comes back to the city that Saul and Jonathan are both dead, Mephibosheth is about five years old. And in her panic to try and save him, his nurse picks him up and runs with him and drops him. And as a result, he's lame in both his feet. I can only assume that she, he, she, he landed on his feet and broke his ankles, or, and there was no surgery in those days. There were no steel pins. So he is lame. We don't hear from him again until much later, when David is already on the throne. And um, if we can put that slide up, please, Ross. It's 2 Samuel 9, from 1 to 10. Thanks. And David said, so David's on the throne, he's sitting one night, and he remembers that he had a covenant relationship with Jonathan. They were in a covenant friendship with one another. And he remembers this. And so he says, is there still anyone left of the house of Saul to whom I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? And of the house of Saul, there was a servant whose name was Ziba. When they called him to David, he said to him, are you Ziba? He said, I, your servant, am he. The king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the unfailing, unsought, unlimited mercy and kindness of God? Ziba replied, Jonathan has yet a son who is lame in his feet. And the king said, Where is he? Ziba replied, He is in the house of Machir, son of Amiel, in Lodi Bar. Now, Lodi Bar was a shanty town in Israel. And the name literally means no pasture or no word. So Mephibosheth is, is destitute. He's poverty struck. He's living in a place where there is no pasture in a shanty town. Then David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, son of Amiel, at Lodi Bar. And Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son, grandson of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and did obeisance. David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold your servant. David said to him, Fear not, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of Saul your grandfather, and you shall eat at my table always. And the cripple bowed himself and said, what is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I am? So Mephibosheth saw himself literally as a dead dog. And in scripture, dogs are always related to shame and dishonor. Sorry for the dog lovers. That's scripture. Okay. <laughs> then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson all that belonged to Saul and to all his house. And you shall till the land for him, you, 
your sons and your servants, and you shall bring in the produce that your master's heir may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. So this is an amazing story of restoration. It's just awesome. He's gone from Lodi Bar back into, into royalty, basically. He has the house, he has the lands, he has now 36 people serving him because he can't harvest. But he's got 36 people there to bring in the harvest, to serve him, to keep the house for him. Beautiful story. But there's one thing that I want to land on, and that's Mephibosheth shall always eat at my table. So, again, let's make a little scenario here. And let's imagine the king's dining room. Because Mephibosheth is now going to eat at the king's table with his sons. So picture that with me. This is the king's dining room. And the people in the dining room, in the dining hall, will all be those that have been extremely honored by the king. That's why they are there. So in the story of David, in his years of running in the wilderness with Saul breathing death, it says that there were a group of men that gathered around him who were in distress, they were in debt, and they were discontented. <laughs> and they became David's mighty men. They grew into a band of soldiers who fought with and for David through his wanderings in the wilderness, and now he's on the throne. I fully imagine that those men would be in the dining hall with David. These are his mighty men. And so I want to talk about a few of them, and this is just an overview. There were many more than this, but if we could put that slide up. Um, the mighty men. So there were the three champions. Okay, that's Joshua Biam. He was chief of the captains who killed 800 men at once with his spear. Then we had Eleazar, who fought alone with David until his sword clung to his hand. He fought for so long they couldn't, they couldn't separate the sword, from, the sword from his hand by the end of that battle. We have Shammah, who defended a plot of barley from an entire camp of Philistines. We have, <laughs> we, <laughs> we have the 30, who were not particularly individuals, but these were David's special ops force. They were various individuals. Then there were the three. And this is the loyalty that these men had for David. At one point, David just says, gee, I feel like a glass of water from such and such a well, which just happens to be in the middle of the Philistine camp. And these three men break into the Philistine camp and come back with a glass of water for David. <laughs> they are deeply, deeply loyal to the king. Then there was Abishai, who is the commander who is most honored of the 30, which were the special ops. He was the brother of Joab, David's military captain, who killed 300 men and the son of a giant. And then there was Benaiah, who killed two Moabite heroes, an Egyptian giant and a lion. So these were... <laughs> These were another, another breed of men. They were hardened veterans of war, battle-scarred, aggressive, took no nonsense, as you can see. So these are the men that are there in the dining hall, laughing, talking, probably quite a few bawdy jokes going around, <laughs> lots of food, music again, the servants are scurrying. This is good. We're in the dining hall. And then there comes the first night that Mephibosheth appears in the doorway. Can you imagine once again the dead silence in the room? And remember, he can't even walk. He can't come on a crutch. There weren't any wheelchairs. He has to have servants carry him into the dining hall. 
and the king's table would have been at the other side of the dining hall, probably raised on some kind of a platform. And everything stops, and all the mighty men look. What is this? And if they knew who he was, many of them would have been reaching for the hilt of their sword because this, this one's grandfather had chased them around the wilderness for years, had had them living in caves like animals and just out of loyalty to David. And here comes Mephibosheth. And all you can hear is the awkward shuffling of the servant's feet as they're carrying him. His wasted, useless legs dangling. Here he comes. So why did he do that? Why didn't he just say to David, hey, thanks, this is wonderful. I think I'll eat at home. Or can I just be in the corner of the dining hall? Why did he have to do that? Well, the answer lies in that name. Mephibosheth means dispeller of shame. And in the dispeller, in the, it's, there's a reference to blow away or scatter into the corner, the shame. So Saul had brought shame on his family line. And his family line had gone from the palace to a shanty town. But God had already chosen Mephibosheth and said, you're going to be the cycle breaker. You are going to be the one who breaks the shame. And the most amazing thing is, this is the most beautiful part, is that as the mighty men are watching and probably looking at David now to say, what is he going to do? David stands or gestures to an empty seat at the table. And when Mephibosheth sits down, the cloth covers his legs. And he looks just like everybody else in the room because grace covers. Yes. And when we are seated at the Father's table, we all look exactly the same. And so Mephibosheth crosses the room because of a destiny that he's carrying. So the other night when Roger was preaching, he quoted something that Chris Vallotton had said. He said, the dogs of doom Stand in the doorway of your destiny. If you can hear them barking, you're approaching your promised land. And if, like me, you have been threatened by the dogs of doom your whole life and step back every time, they don't even have to bark anymore. They just give a low growl. And I would step back. I'm sorry, I forgot my place and step back into the shadows. And that wasn't really a problem. I didn't have to not be in the shadows. The problem with that is the greater one in me then stepped back into the shadows as well. That's where the problem lies. Because what is the destiny that you are carrying in your heart this morning? Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, you have set eternity in our hearts. So there's not a person sitting in this room that doesn't carry a destiny and a calling that is eternal. And we are so much more than the daily grind. So what are you carrying? Are you carrying a prophetic revelation that could change the world? Are you called to be the cycle breaker in your family? Are you called, are you, do you have a gift of healing? What is it that God has placed? on the inside of you. What disqualifies you in your mind as you sit here? Because that spirit of disqualification is one of the devil's favorite games. And what he manages to do with that is to rob the body of Christ of so much because we are carrying things and we can bring them. Is it fear and intimidation? Because that was me. Is it condemnation? Is the devil constantly reminding you of something you did that Jesus doesn't even remember or think about anymore? Is there something that you know you have to put aside? 
in order to cross the wall. Something you don't want to lay down. I know Roger was talking about, about the rowing. I think that's the right word. <laughs> Sometimes being in the shadows is just about not wanting to be accountable. See, while I'm in the shadows and nobody knows what I'm doing, I'm also not accountable to anybody. As soon as I step up, I'm in a position to be discipled. I'm in a position for people to speak into my life and to correct me if necessary. Imagine. <laughs> Imagine that. But Roger asked that question. He said, who are you discipling and who's discipling you? So as soon as we step out there and we say, here I am, we're available to that, aren't we? But at the end of it all, when all is said and done, when I was processing this for myself, the final consideration was this. Who am I going to listen to and obey? The barking of the dogs or the voice of my God? And that was the choice, isn't it? Was I prepared to lay down my pride? Am I prepared to lay down my need to protect myself? Am I prepared to lay down my fear of displeasing people? Because we all know the easiest way to avoid criticism is to do nothing. Am I prepared to lay down my life? Am I prepared to be a living sacrifice? Because that's what this is all about. Am I prepared, like that young boy, to bring the loaves and the fishes through the crowd, put them at the feet of Jesus so that he can break that open and feed the multitudes? Am I prepared to have the alabaster box of my life broken open so that the perfume of the anointing can touch lives? So this morning I'm asking the same question. That was asked of me. Will you cross the room?